Amen. In 1 Samuel 24, as this story continues to unfold with David on the run and Saul continuing to attack him, I want to highlight something in this chapter. First of all, if you'll look at verse number 17, 1 Samuel 24, verse 17, And he said to David, Thou art more righteous than I, for thou hast rewarded me good, whereas I have rewarded thee evil. Uh, this concept is found throughout the Bible, and we're going to take a look at it tonight, and it's called overcoming evil with good. In God's world, in God's economy, when there's an opportunity to do good to someone, and we take that opportunity, we can turn people around, we can make a change in their life. Look at the next verse, verse 18. And thou hast showed this day how thou, thou hast dealt well with me, for as much as when the Lord had delivered me into thine hand, thou killedst me not. For if a man find his enemy, will he let him go well away? Wherefore the Lord reward thee good for that thou hast done unto me this day. This proclamation is coming from Saul as he realizes that literally his life was in the hand of David, his enemy that he's been pursuing. He's tried to kill him multiple times. He had, David had the chance to get him, to take him. And before the Lord, he chose not to do it. And then he humbly reminded him. I want to show you this concept, if you will. Go back to verse 1. How we as Christians, this is something that we're called to do, we're commanded to do. And that is to overcome evil. And there's many ways to overcome evil in your personal life or in the lives of those that you have influence over. And this is one of the neatest ways is to do them good. When somebody is coming at you and you have the power of the Holy Spirit to do good unto them and to bless them and to pray for them and to encourage them and to forgive them when they don't deserve it, sometimes you disarm them and you help them see the situation in spiritual eyes instead of fleshly eyes. In verse number 1, he says, And it came to pass, when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. Now, if you remember, he had, David had 400, well, he had like two or three, and then it was 400 all of a sudden, and then it was 600 as God was beginning to build him and prepare him. David learned how to be a great king by first serving Saul and praying for Saul and comforting Saul and even dealing with the situation. He was able to overcome through it all. Now he's on the run. He's still learning lessons and he's being a blessing to people that are under attack by the enemy out in the wilderness as he's living in caves and holes and all this kind of stuff. Uh, what's interesting in verse number two, if you, where is Saul expecting to find David? He says at the end of it, uh, upon the rocks of the wild goats. Uh, now, there's a couple of you that are here that have had goats, uh, some that couldn't stand them and got rid of them years ago, and some of, them, some of you that are getting to that point now, right? Now, where do goats find themselves? <laughs> They'll go wherever they want. They're going to the highest ground. They're going to a difficult place. They're going where the thorns are at. Saul perceived David as a goat, right, as an evil guy. And he said, he's up with the wild goats. But look where he found him. Look at the next verse, verse 3. And he came to the sheep coats, by the way, you know what a sheep coat is? A coat. That word means hut, but the word, the etymology of it is cottage. It's a little home. See, the wild goats, they can go wherever they want. They can go up into the rocks, but they're wild and they have all the problems that come with that. Uh, goats are often, they have diseases, don't they? There's certain issues with goats you have to be careful of. Well, here, the sheep, well, they're kind of dumb and they have to be protected, right? And they're kind of harmless. And so they had little sheep huts that they would put the sheep in to protect them at night. He goes looking for this wild goat, and here's David as a sheep that needs protection in the sheep coat. Continuing in verse 3, he says, And he came to the sheep coats, by the way, where was a cave, and Saul went in to cover his feet, and David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. Now, when it says Saul went to cover his 
feet, there's one train of thought that that's when a guy goes to the bathroom, he drops his britches and it covers his feet. That's one train of thought. Um, I think he's talking about sleeping. I think Brother Doug was talking about this. We, we talked about this in the past. When you go to sleep, you cover your feet, don't you? Um, I don't, if you look at how the story plays out, I don't think that Saul was awake and conscious the whole time as David and the men were in there and came close to him. I think it's talking about he went in to lay down and cover up with a blanket. Okay? So he goes in to cover his feet. Verse 4. And the man of David said unto him, Behold, the day which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thy hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. And then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. We're going to find out here, we're going to see in the story, that these guys were giving David bad advice. Um, if the kids... If you were joking and you said to the kids, I, what do you think, kids? Should we have pizza and ice cream? They're going to agree. The kids are going to say, yeah. Now, here David's the leader. He's supposed to cut them off when they're doing something wrong. They're telling him, if you notice it, it says right in the middle of the verse, near the end, as it shall seem good unto thee. The devil's message of freedom is do whatever you want. If it feels good, do it. And that's kind of the message they're telling David. Oh, if it feels good to you to go kill that guy, then you go ahead and do it. Verse 5, And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. Now, just a few minutes ago, when our prayer time, as we went through the daily proverb, that famous proverb, what's it? Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Now, David was a man that kept his heart. He kept the wisdom of God and the words of God in his heart. And his heart smote him. Now, let me tell you, we today have the Holy Spirit. And he will work in your heart to do just that. You will begin down a path and the Holy Spirit will say, Hey, don't do that. I'm grieved. I'm upset with you. I'm not happy. Now, the question is, are you going to continue grieving? Are you going to ignore the Holy Spirit and do what you want? Or are you going to allow your heart to kind of, oh, why'd I do that? That was David's response. He realizes he's sinned by taking an action that he should not have. So his heart smote him. Verse 6, and he said unto his men, now he's going to set it straight and tell his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. David makes it real clear. Hey, look, whether I like it or not, he's the boss. God has him in charge. I'm not going to take it in my own hands to kill that man because then I would become a sinner. He says, the Lord forbid. He says, God forbid I should kill him. Right? Why? He's the Lord's anointed. Uh, he didn't want to stretch forth his hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. He says it twice there. This concept is found elsewhere in the scriptures. In fact, in Psalm 105, he says, saying, this is quoting Old Testament, it says, touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. Do my prophets no harm. This isn't just applied to the king. This is God's preachers. It applies to God's people, the Christians as well. And we should not put our, for our hand to attack our brother and sister in Christ, there's a time for correction. There's a time for reproof. There's a time for separation and all of that. But I just want to get it down to us as the average layman in the church. Don't attack other people that are saved. You can help them. You can encourage them. When they're doing evil even, there's a way with good that you can overcome that evil. When they give you evil, don't return fire with evil. And David is giving this concept, he's the Lord's anointed. Now, had he sinned against David? Yeah, amen, big time. He tried to kill him. He was an attempted murderer, and he's lied against David, and he stole his wife back. He, he's already given, you know, he's taken his wife and given her to another man at this point. So David would have been justified, but he's trying to be righteous. And it's very important, you know, years ago, uh, a guy told me, he said, the type of church member that you are is, you know, because year, for years I've believed that the Lord was pointing me toward ministry. And he said, the type of church member you are is the type of church members you will have. 
And I've always had a heart for serving people and helping people. And I thank God He's given me a church full of people that want to serve and want to help and want to love and get closer to God. And I'm thankful for that. And whether or not David is specifically expressing this, David is speaking to his mighty men, which would later become very prominent leaders within his kingdom. And he's demonstrating to them, we don't just do what feels good to us. When the Holy Spirit reveals sin unto us, we should respond to that. And we should then teach others around us and below us and above us, we're not going to do what's wrong. We're not going to sin against God's word. And that's what David is doing. He's teaching, this is a very big leadership lesson, to humble yourself to your followers and say, I've sinned. What I did was wrong. We shouldn't do this. Hey guys, you know, mom and dad, we have to sometimes we have to say, I'm sorry. Mommy shouldn't have said that. Daddy shouldn't have said that about that person. Let's pray for them. Right? These are godly concepts. Look at verse 7. So David stayed his servants with these words. Strong words here. He was able to persuade them, convince them, don't go kill this man, stay with me, just by his words. He stayed his servants with these words and suffered them not to rise against Saul, but Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. David also arose afterward and went out of the cave and cried after Saul, saying, My Lord, the king! And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed himself. So here, David presents himself as a humble servant. Can you imagine? The king leaves the cave. Here's David, the one he's after, following. My Lord, the king! And he bows down humbly, submitting, showing that he's not trying to get over him, that he's still his servant in God's pecking order, if you will. Verse 9, And David said to Saul, Wherefore hearest thou men's words? saying, Behold, David seeketh thy hurt. He says, Why are you listening to people that are telling you I'm trying to hurt you? Behold, this day thine eyes have seen how that the Lord hath delivered thee today into mine hand in the cave, and some bade me kill thee, but mine eye spared thee. And I said, I will not put forth mine hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. David's still recognizing the position, the title, the authority, just recognizing the structure that God still had in place. David was walking by faith at this moment because he was already told you're going to be the king. He was already told Saul doesn't deserve to be the king. He understood that. And yet he's walking by faith, humbly patient. You know what? It's probably going to be better if I wait on God's timing instead of forcing it myself and taking matters into my own hand. Verse 11, moreover, my father, now this is interesting, he calls him my Lord. He calls him my father. In a lot of ways, Saul was like a father unto David earlier on in, in these chapters where he was teaching him things and learn, he was learning things and he took him under his wing and provided for him and he was expected to eat at the family table. And so he's reverencing him as a father. My father, he calls him. See, yea, the skirt of thy robe in my hand. For in that I cut off the skirt of thy robe and killed thee not. I just want to pause here at verse 11 for a second. This is symbolic. This is very symbolic. Go back to chapter 15. He's, now, visualize it. He comes out of the cave. David tells him, I'm your servant. Don't listen to them. I'm not trying to kill you. By the way, I have this piece of your robe that I just cut off of your robe, showing that he had his weapon close enough to actually kill him and slay him. But why just the piece of the robe? I think, again, this, there's spiritual significance here. If you're in chapter 15, first look at verse 23. For rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Boy, this was a learning time. I mean, Saul was blessed and things were happening. And he said, nope, I'm going to do it my way. We're, I'm afraid of the people. I'm afraid of the enemy. I'll do it my way. And he says, no, I would rather you obey me. He says, you're being rebellious, and that's just like witchcraft. He says, you're being stubborn, and you reject my word. Therefore, I'm rejecting you from the blessing I've given you. 
And so it continues where uh, he says, I've sinned, I feared the people, pray they pardon my sin. Look at verse 26. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned about to go away, he laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle, and it rent. So here's Saul grabbing Samuel's robe, and it rips. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. I imagine those words reverberated in Saul's head over the years, especially as he discovered that David was the one, especially when things would happen and David would get glory and he'd be like, oh, that he's going to be, that's my neighbor that's better than me. And God's going to rip the kingdom like he did that robe and he's going to give it to this man. So now go back to 1 Samuel verse 24, where we see in verse number 11, moreover, my father, see, yea, See the skirt of thy robe in my hand, for in that I cut off the skirt of thy robe and killed thee not. Know thou and see that there is neither evil nor transgression in my hand, and I have not sinned against thee, yet thou huntest my soul to take it. He's saying, you're trying to murder me. I had the chance to do it to you. I didn't do it. I've ripped your robe. Here's your robe right here. The Lord judge between me and thee, and the Lord avenge me of thee, but my hand will not be upon thee. This is a strong statement. This is the lesson for tonight. Let the Lord judge. Let the Lord get vengeance. We do not like to do that. That does not come naturally. You know what comes naturally? I know what I'll do. I'll show them. I'll put nails in their tires. I'll, I'll hook, take their hose when they go on vacation. And I'll pour it in their window and let their whole house get flooded. I know what I'll do. I'll get online and talk about them. Or I know what I'll do. I'll get back at them. I'll do it worse to them. Well, that's the natural man. That's the sinister flesh letting the devil use you to just start a feud and a quarrel, contention that may last years. Well, that's not God's will for us. He says, the Lord judge. It, it, now, he's just humbled himself and he says, you know what? God will judge between the two of us. That's what I want because I, I can't see clearly to judge clearly between us. If you ask me, I'm right and you're wrong on every account. And that's not the truth. So I want to stand for the truth and I want the Lord to judge between us and let the Lord judge righteously. He says, the Lord judge between me and thee and the Lord avenge me of thee, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. As saith the proverb of the ancients, wickedness proceeded from the wicked, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. After whom is the king of Israel come out? After whom dost thou pursue? After a dead dog? After a flea? It's interesting. He says, hey, who are you after anyway? Me? Little old me? I'm just like a dead dog. I am nothing. Now, isn't that, kind, isn't that what Goliath told him? Oh, you're a dead dog. You're just a dog. And he's going to use this same line against him one more time. In two chapters, he's going to say the same thing. I'm just a dog. I'm like a bird. Here he says, who are you after anyway? A dead dog? Wait a minute. You're a king with a big old kingdom and you can do all this stuff and you're coming after me? I'm not coming after you. I'm not doing you harm. I'm not a pest in your kingdom. I'm not you know, trying to cause contention and rebellion. I'm not even near you. You're coming after a flea? I'm not a big deal. I'm nothing. Verse 15. The Lord, therefore... Be judge, and judge between me and thee, and see, and plead my cause, and deliver me out of thy hand. There's a lot in this verse, and this is the key. This is what it's all about. I'm going to commit it into the Lord's hands, and just trust Him to do what's best. I've been hurt. I've been wrong. I want revenge. I think I know what to do. I know how to get them good. No, no, no. You know what I want? Let me be righteous and let the Holy Spirit work through me. Let the Lord judge. Let the Lord see what's going on. Let the Lord plead. Let Him cry out and plead against them or for me. Plead my cause and then let the Lord deliver me out of thy hand. Here's His ultimate prayer. Just leave me alone. Hey, I'm going to bring it to God. And I'm going to let God make it even. And I'm going to let God tell you why you're wrong. And I'm going to let God get you. And I'm going to, I just want to be left alone. And that's literally what he's saying to him. If you would go to Luke chapter 6. 
We'll come back in just a second. Go to Luke chapter 6. We see that David's heart smote him. David was a man after God's own heart. He had a heart like God on certain issues at certain times. David was still a sinner. I think it's one of the, this is one of those big moments that we're supposed to pay attention to and say, David had a heart even to bless his enemy and do good to his enemy and spare his enemy and pray for his enemy when he had a chance to just kill him and crush him and finish the job. But if he had done that, I believe that you know things would not have worked out. I believe the kingdom would have went against David and uh, perhaps he would not have succeeded in whatever he tried. Again, in the Lord's economy, everything's upside down compared to the world. The way Jesus says to operate, it's completely different from everything else. Look at Luke chapter 6. Look at verse 27. But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies and do good to them that hate you. Boy, that's hard to do. Love your enemies and do good to them that hate you. Bless them that curse you. And pray for them which despitefully use you. These are two of the hardest verses in the Bible. They're easy to read. It's so simple a child can understand it. Amen? Does anybody not understand what's being taught here? Does everybody get it? Very simple. Now who would say, oh, that's easy to do. I've, I've mastered that. <laughs> not one of us. Not one of us. It doesn't seem natural. Here's our problem. When we judge for ourselves... It doesn't seem right. Right to us is I need to get up over them and I need to be justified and I need to be, you know, we're putting ourselves forward instead of others. Love your enemies, right? Bless them that curse you. Verse 29. And unto him that smiteth thee on one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. This is a strong statement. When somebody comes to steal from you, and you catch them in the moment, and you say, hey, here you go, take it. Let me give you something else. How dare you? Don't you know resources are limited? We're supposed to be a wise steward. We're supposed to be a protector. Those things still hold true. We're not talking about letting people abuse you, but there comes a point in life sometimes where God is using it as an opportunity, and we want to hold on to a piece of possession and God wants us to grow past the things of this world and just let it go. And he has a bigger blessing for us on the other side. Usually it's not even so much about the stuff. Usually it's about our own self-image, how we see ourselves. Or at least how we want people to perceive us as smart and we have our own freedom and I do what I want and I have a job that matches my IQ and you know what I mean we see ourselves up here and we don't want to lose any of that so we're not willing to let anything go he says in verse 31 and as ye would that men should do to you do ye also to them likewise hard statement again when somebody you're dealing with somebody you literally have to think what would I want them to do to me? Well, I would want them to just give me everything. Okay, then give them everything. You know, do what you got to do. How do you want to be treated? That's how you should treat people. It's the concept he's teaching. Verse 32. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. He says, you're no different than the world. And if you do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. Verse 34. And if ye lend to them of whom ye have ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. Hey, I need a hundred bucks. I don't, I'm not so sure you're going to be able to pay me back or... I, I will as long as you pay me back an extra 20 bucks, right? We want to get what we can. I mean, my rule of thumb has become I won't lend anything to anybody. Um, I'd rather give it to them. I'd rather, uh, I, I don't lend anything that I'm not willing to completely lose. Um, I had somebody, you know, having problems, money's tight, this thing happened and that thing happened and he wasn't even asking. But it just so happened that somebody else had blessed me. Here's a hundred bucks. I'm like, I don't need it. 
God's been good to me. And he's like, no, just take it, please. Let it be a blessing because it's a blessing to give. That's God's, right? It's a blessing to give. And so I was able to give that person a blessing by taking $100. I put it in my wallet. It stayed there for a day or two. And then a coworker starts telling me the woes of what's happening in their life and things just aren't working. I said, wait a minute, I, I got it, I got it. And I pulled it out and I said, here you go, God bless you. And they said, no, 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 I, I can't take it. And I'm like, I want you to take it. And they said, well, I can pay it back in three days. I don't want you to pay it back. God bless you. Thank you. Don't thank me. Thank God. Look at God. This came from God. Somebody gave it to me just to give away, I believe, and you're the one to give it away to. And so this $100 made it way to you because God loves you. I want you to know that and feel that and see that. And this is what Jesus did because you think about it. Jesus has more power than any man that's ever walked the earth. And yet he didn't walk around with a bunch of stuff following him. But every time he needed something, there it was. And if we have this kind of faith, because here's what it comes down to. Why won't I let somebody get one up on me? Why do I want to get revenge on somebody? Because I have a lack of faith. Why won't I bless them that curse me? Why won't I love them that hate me? Because I have a lack of faith. Well, if we'll get past that and we'll grow in our faith and we'll just realize God wants me to just trust for him to provide everything. And we take that big old leap of faith sometimes and it's like, I don't see how this is going to work out. But I know you own it all, and I know you love me, and I, you haven't, I haven't missed anything, and I believe there's a big lesson to learn here. And this is what Jesus is teaching, to give to everyone that asks. And it's okay, because God's going to give me it right back, or, or, or he's going to just eliminate the needs, and he'll take care of it all. He says in verse 35, But love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, which ye shall, your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest. Now look, we're the sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus, he tells us in Galatians chapter 3. Here he's saying, you would be known as a child of God. When you give, when you love, when you forgive, that person on the other side will give God glory for how you worked, for how you demonstrated it. I've known a bunch of Christians, they were all hypocrites, but I tell you, that guy went out of his way to do the right thing. That's honorable. We'll be known as the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Do you know God gives you blessings that you have not been kind enough to say thank you? You have things in your life right now that God gave you and you didn't turn right around and say, thank you. I try to teach our children at the dinner table to tell their mom, thank you for preparing dinner. Why? It's expected. No. We need to be thankful. We need to have a good attitude. We need to consider that work went into it to bless us. And that's how God wants us to be. To be thankful and kind. Verse 36. Be ye therefore merciful as your father is also merciful. That one's hard too. Be merciful as God was merciful to you. Verse 37, judge not and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive and ye shall be forgiven. Now you understand he's changing gears, he's shifting gears and we're about done here. But I just want you to think about verse 37. We're quick to judge people, aren't we? And we're quick to judge our brother in Christ. Oh, I see their problem. I see where they have it all wrong. And it's a two-way street. They see your problem. And they love you enough. Why don't, so don't judge them. In fact, what's he say? Don't condemn them. He says, forgive them. And you'll be forgiven. Verse 38, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure. Pressed down and shaken together. And running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Uh, when he says the measure that you meet, that's a meter stick, or we call a yard stick, or a measuring tape. However you measure people, you walk up to somebody, oh yeah, you're one of those, huh? Well, that, they're going to do the same to you. You're being measured by that same standard, how you treat people. But the neat thing, we, we did this as an illustration um, Brother Elijah, you helped me with it, didn't you? And I think your brother did too, where, where he says, um, it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down and shaken together. And he had a jar of brown sugar. And I gave him a good measure. It was about to the top, right? And I put the lid on. Is there room for any more? Not really. Well, we shook it and we shook it. And there, there was more room. 
And then we pressed it down and there was even more room and we kept filling that thing up until there was a mess. I don't think the ant, you know, it took a while to get rid of the ants after that one, but you know, it was just demonstrating what happens is sometimes we say, nope, I've got enough. And it's like, no, keep pushing it in there. Keep measuring. Well, that's how we measure to other people. You keep pouring on the love. You keep forgiving them. You keep praying for them. You keep forgiving them. And then Christ can get the glory in the situation. Go to Romans 12. Go to Romans chapter 12. Again, the thought here is how do we overcome evil with good? Well, it's by faith. What measure of faith do you have? Do you have enough faith to believe that if somebody just really got you, I mean, maybe they punched you, maybe they embarrassed you, maybe they stole some money from you, do you have enough faith to commit it to God and let God judge between and just give it to the Lord? Do you have enough faith even to pray for that person in hopes that maybe God wants you to restore them or become friends with them? This is where every Christian needs to grow. Romans, chapter, Romans 12, look at verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. It means not fake, not simulated. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Uh, we're going to deal with this what is evil in this chapter real quick. Abhor. What does that mean? To hate. To hate. To despise. Now, wait a minute. We hate the wicked works of the world. We don't want to let that infection into our family and into our church. He says, hate what's evil and cleave to that which is good. Don't be fake. Don't give the world a fake love even. Oh, that's good for you, right? Verse 10. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. He's talking about being sincere in your love and loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. Now look at verse 14. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. He says, don't look like them. They cursed you, curse them back. Don't do it. Bless them. Now look at verse 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. There's your Christian reputation. We're not returning fire. Boom, 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 boom. That never works out well for anybody. Don't return evil, he's saying. Verse 18, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Some men you just can't be peaceable with because they keep trying to beat up on you. Okay, then just get away from the situation. But when it is possible to live peaceably with somebody and to bless them, even when they curse you, there's going to come a point where they're going to swing a punch and you're, you're going to block it and say, hey man, just stop. I don't want to fight you. 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 And then finally they're just going to stop. Our tendency is to get in there and throw one back and sucker punch them. He says in verse 19, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. You know, a parallel to that, he says, don't give place unto the devil. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. When you give in to your wrath, you're letting the devil win. When you don't revenge, when you don't avenge yourself, you're giving place to the Holy Spirit. He says, avenge not yourselves. He says, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And I think most Christians have a faith problem. They don't believe that promise that God says you commit it to me and don't worry, I'll take care of them. Instead, we walk by little faith and we go out and we get our own vengeance and it's not enough. It's never enough. And we're not satisfied and they didn't get justice. Whereas if we just let it go, we committed it to the Lord. We started praying for them that despitefully used us and we blessed them that, hey, at us and we say, God, I, I just have to, I don't want this root of bitterness in my heart and I don't want to become like them and I, I want to overcome evil with good. So I believe your promise that vengeance is the Lord's. It belongs to the Lord. He will repay. I believe that. Look at it. It says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. I ask you, do you believe that? If you do, then let him do it. And in the meantime, you look like Christ, you act like Christ, you love like Christ. Therefore, verse 20, Therefore, if thine enemy be hungry, hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. And finally, the thought, verse 21, Be not overcome of evil, 
but overcome evil with good. We still hate the evil. We're not going to let it in our life. We're not going to become like the evil, but we're going to continue putting more light in the situation. If all the lights go out in the building, I guarantee it would be very dark, but one little flashlight and you can shine a light, can't you? You shine a light and we can see where to go. And that's what's happened. Darkness is coming after the Christian and that bad attitude and that bad spirit, but we have the light of Christ inside of us and he's just saying, just shine the light. <laughs> Let him do the vengeance. Overcome that evil with good. This is what we're commanded to do. Right, go back to 1 Samuel 24. You have the power to overcome evil with simple, humble, prayerful, loving methods. It's called good. It's called love. Patience. Not needing revenge immediately. In Proverbs 24, verse 29, he says, Say not, I will do so unto him as he hath done to me. I will render to the man according to his work. He says, don't say that. I'll give him what he deserves. Don't say that. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 15, See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. He says, always do what is good. Ever follow what is good among yourselves in the church and with the people out in the world. 1 Peter 3, verse 9, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing, knowing that you're thereunto called, that you should inherit a blessing. You're called to give a blessing and you're called to inherit a blessing, but when you rail back at somebody that rails at you or you revile, then when somebody reviles you, you give evil back, you miss your blessing. You miss it. Now let's finish this chapter. We're almost done. Look at verse 16. 1 Samuel 24, verse 16. And it came to pass when David had made an end of speaking these words unto Saul, that Saul said, Is this thy voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. It broke his heart. You see that. And he said to David, Thou art more righteous than I, for thou hast rewarded me good, whereas I have rewarded thee evil. And thou hast showed this day how that thou hast dealt well with me, for as much as when the Lord had delivered me into thine hand, thou killedst me not. For if a man find his enemy, will he let him go well away? It's interesting, he's saying this to him in verse number 19, because here's Saul with 3,000 men behind him, and here comes David by himself out of the cave. He's got a few hundred hiding in the cave, but here's, there's that one man that the 3,000 are after, and he comes out and he says, My Lord, I'm your servant. Hey, wait, listen to me. Why are you coming after me? I love you. I'm praying for you. I could have killed you, and I didn't want to do it. I, I mean you no harm. And then David is humbled by the Lord by this truth. Or, I'm sorry, Saul is humbled by it. He is overcome with good. Saul had an evil heart. He's now overcome with good. Saul had the ability to slay David in that moment. He could have taken him out and been done, right? But the Lord overwhelmed his heart. He overshadowed him. Again, Saul is saved. We'll see him in heaven. He says in verse 19, The Lord reward thee good, for that thou hast done unto me this day. And now, behold, I know well that thou shalt surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in thine hand. Now he goes to another level and he says, now I know for sure you're God's anointed, you're going to be the king. I think he's even saying you're going to be a better king than I am. I think he's recognizing this is the kind of man I'd like to follow as a king, one that's willing to let his enemy have a pass. Verse 21, Swear now therefore unto me by the Lord that thou will not cut off my seed after me and that thou will not destroy my name out of my father's house. And David swear unto Saul. And Saul went home. But David and his men got them up into the hold. It's interesting, again, Saul with his 3,000 and all of his physical power was humbled, and now he's petitioning this single man. Promise you won't kill all of my children when you become the king. He really was acquiescing to David's power. He was giving in. He, he in a sense, was bowing and saying, you're going to be the next king. God's hand is on you. you do, you're greater than I am. Please don't destroy all of my family. And Saul tucks his tail between his leg, and he goes home, and 
Uh, now for a moment, David has peace again. It's neat that David's heart smote him just for cutting off the robe. I think as Christians, we need to be very tender in our heart. Be close to the Lord. Get His Word in our heart. Ask the Holy Spirit to lead us every step of the way. And when God gets you, when He pricks you in the heart, when He smites you in the heart, hearken to it. Listen to it. Here, is, uh, here with David, he was able to overcome evil by doing the right thing, by doing good. You have that same power. Now you take this information and you apply it to your life. You're going to have an opportunity to use this to help somebody else recognize they're in the wrong place. Not by yelling at them, but by loving them and praying for them. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, much, thank you so much for your word. And Lord, thank you for the example given to us by David that he had a heart like you to love even those that hate him. Lord, I'm thankful that you love the lost sinners in this world. And Lord, I pray you would help us to take that love and preach the gospel to the lost. Lord, and help us to be a loving and forgiving people, not bitter, not angry, not hateful. But Lord, I pray that you would help us to bless those that curse us and overcome evil with good. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.